All right. Um, so um, the, let me um, say hello to everybody in this seminar. And uh, I will give a very brief introduction uh, about our speaker today uh, before the presentation. Um, so um, Professor Dr. Jenny Reid is currently working at uh, the Institute of Neuroscience at Newcastle University. And Dr. Reid has particular interest in stereopsis and has done extensive and massive works in this field. And her works range from the human psychophysics to computational models to clinical disorders. And today, Dr. Wade will show us another very interesting aspect, which is uh, stereopsis in insects and compared with human binocular vision. So um, let's welcome, and it's your time now, Jenny. Great. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, delighted to have this invitation to come and speak to you. Um, definitely do ask questions during the talk, especially if there's anything I say that isn't clear so that we can clarify that before I continue. And then more open-ended questions we can have as a discussion at the end. I want to begin by uh, crediting the people whose work I'm going to be presenting here, notably Dr. Vivek Nityananda and Dr. Ronnie Rosner. The outline of what I'm aiming to cover today is a brief background on stereopsis, um, how wide evolved, a bit of a background on insect vision, because that's quite different um, from what many of us are used to, talking about how the sort of technical issues of studying stereopsis and insects. Then I'd like to talk about what we've learned from behavioural experiments, and finally some of the neurophysiological results about the neurological underpinnings of insect stereopsis. So to begin with, to get us all on the same page, what I mean by stereopsis is a perception of depth or distance that depends on the different views of the world that we have via the two eyes. So for example, if you're looking at an object like this mountain, so if you're fixating it, by definition, it's projecting to the fovea in each image, so it's um, projecting to identical locations in the two eyes. But then consider a nearer object like this tree, Hopefully you can see that from the left eye's point of view, the tree is to the right of the mountain, whereas in the right eye's view, the tree is to the left of the mountain. So in other words, there's this offset or disparity between the view of the trees in the two eyes. And that disparity can be interpreted and used by your brain as a cue telling you that the tree is physically in front of the mountain. So, as Jin you mentioned, I've spent a lot of time studying stereopsis, so I thought I might try and convince you why this is an interesting or useful thing to do. One reason I think it's quite important is, is the clinical relevance, as again Jin you mentioned. So stereopsis is really challenging. As you can imagine, it, it's to do with the input from both eyes, so it requires good vision in each eye individually. It also, certainly in humans, requires good ocular motor control because you have to direct both eyes to look at the same point in space. And then finally, you have to have the brain mechanisms to put all that together and extract depth information. So if anything goes wrong at any of these points, then you won't have good stereopsis. And so perhaps it's not surprising that there are many disorders of binocular, division, uh, binocular vision. It seems quite a demanding aspect of visual function. So you can have strabismus, where the eyes point in different directions, as shown here. There's amblyopia, which is a form of visual impairment, not due to any problem with the eye itself, but due to problems with the brain not listening to inputs from that particular eye. So it effectively becomes blind, even though the eye itself is, is just fine. And you can have double vision, so where uh, the two eyes' images are not correctly fused into a single view of the world, but you're aware of both of them at once. And actually, binocular disorders like this are now the most common cause of visual impairment in children in the developed world. So I think understanding the neural basis of binocular vision is going to be important in order to understand how these arise, how we might prevent them, and how we might fix them. Um, I've spent some time recently uh, developing um, a new way of measuring stereo acuity, which is shown in this little video here. And the idea is it presents a task on a 3D tablet where you can actually see a stimulus standing out in depth. 
I'm afraid, of course, you won't be able to see that on the 2D screen, so you'll have to trust me. But the idea is that it's trying to um, test stereo vision in quite a fun, gamified and intuitive way uh, that makes it easier to measure the vision of young children. Another reason why I think understanding stereopsis is important is that increasingly we are able to manipulate stereopsis on modern digital 3D displays like the 3D tablet I just mentioned. So surgeons nowadays can be doing remote keyhole surgery using tools and looking not directly at the patient's body, but at a 3D display of the interior of the patient's body um, that's being recorded by cameras. So again, it's very important to understand how do they interpret depth in images like that? What aspects of the image could cause somebody to misperceive depth? I mean, clearly that could have very adverse consequences in this sort of situation. Um, in medical imaging as well, presenting information on 3D displays can often really make it much clearer and easier to interpret. But again, we need to understand um, the details of perception in such images. And finally, of course, there's lots of applications for entertainment. So that's an important industrial application. Another slightly different industrial application is trying to replicate stereopsis in machines. So obviously, understanding distance is very important for any autonomous system. It's <laughs> certainly one that can move around like a self-driving car. And People have developed computer stereo algorithms that give computers a form of stereo vision. And in some ways, these now perform better than human stereopsis is able to. But in other ways, they perform worse. They're less robust and they're also very computationally demanding. So I think everyone would agree there's scope to improve them. And perhaps by studying biological systems, we can learn things which will help us to do that. And then finally, there's a kind of pure science reason for studying stereopsis. So, and I really like this little paragraph from Steven Pinker's book, How the Mind Works, where he says that stereo vision is one of the glories of nature, which I think is absolutely true. And this is how I tend to think of it. It's interesting in its own right, but it's also interesting as a particularly simple and a, a simple form of perception where we understand the underlying geometry and the underlying laws, particularly clearly. So we feel we have a a clear idea of the task the system's trying to solve, and that makes it easier to then tackle how our nervous systems actually solving this problem. So I hope I've convinced you that stereopsis is worth studying. I also wanted to take some time to bust some myths about stereopsis, which I think are surprisingly widespread um, long after they should have died. So the first one I, I can illustrate with a quote from a book 100 years ago, um, that the ability to see objects in relief, stereopsis, is confined solely to man and to a few of the higher animals in whom the eyes are placed side by side. That's actually not correct. We now know that humans and other higher animals with the eyes side by side, like monkeys, are far from the only creatures that have stereopsis. We discovered stereopsis fairly late in humans in the 19th century, and we found it in monkeys. But actually, we now know that you find it in prey animals like horses and mice and sheep where the eyes are off to one side. You also find it in birds, interestingly. Now we only know it in predatory birds such as owls and falcons um, who do have their eyes side by side. But interestingly, the anatomy of binocular vision suggests that even binocular vision itself independently evolved in mammals and birds and therefore Stereopsis must also have evolved independently in these two systems. For a similar reason, it must have evolved independently in amphibians. We find it in toads. Recently, stereopsis was discovered in cephalopods, in cuttlefish, and it's known so far in just one insect, the praying mantis. So I think that's a very widespread range of animals across the animal kingdom who demonstrably do have stereopsis. So it's certainly not true that it's restricted to man and a few of the higher animals. And the fact that it's evolved independently so many times suggests, I think, that it really must be quite important and valuable for many animals. Do jumping spiders not have stereopsis? 
You, my next slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so exactly, people often ask, what about jumping spiders? Do they have stereopsis? Now, I think it's very likely that they do. It's extremely suggestive that out of their eight eyes, they have one pair that are right on the front, very large, high resolution. And of course, they jump, so they need to know distance very accurately. So I would not be at all surprised if these eyes are doing doing a form of stereoscopic depth perception, but nobody has done an experiment to prove it. And of course, it's rather hard to do such experiments in these animals. So dragonflies, again, it's been suggested they may use stereopsis and predatory insects. The hammerhead shark is suggestive because it's evolved this enormous head where the eyes are very far apart. So it's got a huge baseline, which improves the precision of stereopsis if you're doing stereopsis. But we just don't know. Um, I think watch this space, it's an exciting area, and maybe some of you will do experiments in the future to investigate some of these animals. I want to come back to the idea of frontal facing eyes. So we've seen that you don't need front facing eyes to do stereopsis, and actually, arguably, it, it actually makes you worse at stereopsis, right? So this is a little sketch of two creatures which differ only in that this one has their eyes placed laterally, and this one has the same eyes placed frontally. All you need for stereopsis is some binocular overlap, so some region of space where objects can be viewed from both eyes. And within that, lateral eyes actually give you a wider baseline. So the difference in the angle subtended by these objects is greater for the lateral eyed animal than the frontal eyed animal. So this animal would be expected, other things being equal, to have a greater range and precision of stereopsis. Front facing eyes. You can think, well, what advantages do they give us? They give us a particularly wide binocular overlap. So you see in this example, the binocular overlap is extending um, closer to the animal. Um, and if you rotate the fields of view, um, you can get a wider binocular overlap in angular terms as well. So you know, that might be useful, not necessarily just for stereopsis. You might um, need that for other uh, binocular advantages, such as improved contrast summation. One thing that they do do, I think, is front facing eyes can improve optical quality in the frontal area. And to illustrate this, um, I've drawn here a picture of a bird with lateral placed eyes. So maybe like a starling or something. So many birds, the optical axis, the center of symmetry, kind of by definition, tends to be in the middle of the field of view. And so if you have lateral eyes, then your optic axes are pointing outwards. But for many animals, the region directly in front of you is going to be the most relevant. So many birds have got a kind of fovea analog, um, a region of high neural quality directly in front of them. But the optical quality is generally highest in imaging systems along the optic axis. So a creature like this with lateral eyes has its highest optical quality off to the side, even if it's trying to get a high neural quality in front. And by swinging the eyes round, as we do in primates, we bring the optic axis and the central vision, the fovea, closer together. And so if you're really trying to get good image quality at the fovea, that's probably something you need to do just for optical reasons. It's not necessarily clear to me that stereopsis um, is the driving force behind that. Uh, maybe you just want good monocular vision. OK, so those are the advantages that I can identify for front facing eyes, um, wide binocular overlap and improved optical quality, which is especially important when the pupils are large. And so the depth of focus um, is particularly narrow. Both of those might be especially important at night in low light levels, which make your pupils big which means that optical quality is particularly important. And so maybe that's why we find these front facing eyes, particularly in nocturnal animals, whether it's the bush baby or the cat or the owl or the kakapo, the New Zealand night parrot. Anyway, there was a bit of a digression on some myths of stereopsis, but let's get back to mantids. Now I said no one knows whether jumping spiders have got stereopsis, but how do we actually know that mantids have got stereopsis? Well, the answer is that was demonstrated really convincingly with a beautiful paper from Samuel Russell back in 1983. And so some background, praying mantids are ambush predators, so they lie in wait, 
And when a fly or similar tasty morsel comes within range, they strike out with their spiky forelegs and they grab it. And so this is why depth perception is important, right? You have to know when to launch your strike. And it had long been speculated that they do this by measuring the binocular disparity, um, the difference in position of the object as viewed from each eye. And Russell set out to prove this, and he did this in a very clever way, by putting prisms in front of the animal's eyes, face out prisms. Now, of course, the thing about a prism is it bends the light ray. So uh, Russell um, suggested that if the animal was using stereopsis to deduce where its prey was, then when the prey was really over here, the mantis would think the prey was there, and so it would launch its strike prematurely. And sure enough, he showed very beautifully that exactly that happened. And furthermore, the pattern of strike errors varied with the angle of the base out prism in exactly the predicted way. So this was really compelling evidence that the mantis must be using binocular disparity because all the other depth cues you can think of, you know, maybe like motion parallax, if it moves its head or looming as the object gets closer, none of those would be changed by the prism, only binocular disparity. So when I came across that work, I was really struck because I'd also been struck by the similarity of stereopsis across mammals and birds, basically. So it's been studied extensively in monkeys, mainly, and also barn owls amongst birds. And Robert van der Villigan wrote a paper summarizing the results that owls see in stereo much like humans do, which I've always thought is very remarkable, given that these are two extremely different animals occupying very different ecological niches, and which have independently evolved stereo vision, and yet it ends up being really similar in both animals. And to talk about wh why it's similar, I want to mention the stereo correspondence problem. So this is something that you have to face in stereopsis. You start from the retinal images and you're trying to work out what's in the world in front of you. And that requires you to match up which objects in space correspond to the same objects on the retina, okay? And how do you know that you're looking at a situation like this with two objects at roughly equal depth and not at a situation like this? So the retinal images haven't changed between these two situations. The only thing that's changed is what objects on the two retinae belong together. And I've indicated that with the, the pink and black color coding. This problem is placed at its most extreme in abstract patterns like this random dot pattern. And there's some evidence that I'll touch on later that vertebrate stereopsis works by cross correlation. So in both humans and owls, the way stereopsis seems to work is that as it were, you can think of it as sliding a piece of the left image across the piece of the right image. And where the correlation is highest, that's where you know, the images must match. So as I say, there's evidence that that forms the basis of stereopsis in humans and in owls, and also in many machine vision algorithms. So again, you, you assess matches between the two by using a goodness of match metric, often based on cross correlation. So as I say, I was struck by the fact that the mechanisms of stereopsis seem very similar in these two taxa. And so when I heard about insects, it naturally made me think, oh, what about bees? And so that's really what got me into stereopsis in insects, trying to understand how it works and how it relates to human and bird. But before I dive into what we found out, I want to bust a few myths about insect vision as well while I'm at it. So when I talk about this work, a common question people ask me is, well, isn't everything completely different in insect vision because they have these compound eyes, right? It's, it's all utterly different. And I want to argue they're less different than you might think. And so this touches on a myth, right? Here's an image. This is what you get if you peel off the cornea from the front of an insect eye. So you have all these little lenses, all these little facets or omatidia as they're called. And if you hold it up and look through it, you see a series of replications of the real world. So this is the number seven viewed through a bit of insect cornea. And you can see it, at each, the, the letter is replicated and you see it in each of the facets. But of course, the insect itself is not holding up its cornea and looking through it with what a different set of eyes, right? That's not how vision works. And so it's completely illogical to think that this is how insects perceive their world. And people have 
it was briefly suggested in the 19th century that animals might, insects might see their world replicated in this way, but it was rapidly dismissed as, you know, no, that, that's not how it works. And yet it's a bit like the front facing eyes. It's a myth that won't die. Um, you can see it in this 1958 um, movie, The Fly. Can you hear that? So this is about a scientist who carelessly gets his head transformed into a fly. And now we see, as it were, through the fly's eyes. <laughs> and so he sees many copies of his horrified wife. But strangely, this is not how insects see the world, despite the fact that you can still to this day buy educational toys that will contain many lenses and enable you to see like a bug would see. But it's not how a bug sees. <laughs> so really, the big difference between simple and compound eyes is that simple eyes are more efficient. So our eyes collect light from a particular direction across the entire pupil, from the entire lens. And then the, lens, the optical power of the system focuses all that light down onto a single photoreceptor, right? So the photoreceptor is collecting all light from that direction. And then light from a different visual direction is collected by a different photoreceptor, and that is how we form an image. Now, a compound eye, each photoreceptor has got its very own lens, and that accepts light from one direction only. So you see all this light coming from one direction. It's only the small bundle in the shaded region which gets detected by a photoreceptor. And then again, from all the light from a different direction hitting the insect's eye, only this small bit is getting detected by a different photoreceptor. So it's less efficient, although arguably simpler and less optically demanding, but in both cases the end result is simply a retinal image, a little mosaic made up of pixels, which are the photoreceptors. So I think you can actually discount the fact that insect eyes are compound eyes. And practically speaking, the only real implication is that the image has very low resolution. So to summarize then, these are the sort of differences, man versus mantis, half a billion years of separate evolution. So we've both got brains, we've got an enormous brain with absolutely loads of neurons. They have rather tiny brains with probably only a million neurons. No one's ever counted, but those are estimates for similar insects. Ours consumes a lot of power. The, the human brain is one of the most energy hungry organs in the body. Insects overall can um, consume very little power. Our mantids live off one or two crickets a week and that keeps them going. Uh, we've both got two eyes, ours are simple, there's a compound, but we've seen that doesn't really matter. Both of them have, I put a fovea, technically a region of high visual acuity. I mean, technically a fovea is the pit in the retinal surface, which mantids don't have, but they have an area of high acuity like we do. We've got really good resolution and they've got very poor resolution even in their fovea. Our eyes move around all the time clearly, and we can also accommodate to adjust our focus. Mantis eyes are fixed on their head and they also have fixed focus. So we've got very different hardware, but both of us are doing stereopsis. And we wanted to ask how. So the first problem we faced was how do you present stereoscopic 3D images to an insect? And that occupied basically the entire first year of Vivek's work with me. Vivek is now running his own lab as a David Phillips fellow at Newcastle University. Now you might say, well, didn't Russell show you how to do this? But the trouble is with the prisms, they basically can only shift the entire image nearer or further away stereoscopically, which is, of course, very valuable. But we wanted to display the more complex kind of stimuli that have been so valuable in humans and monkeys and owls and so on in really dissecting apart how stereopsis worked. And so we needed to come up with a different approach. And I've got a little video clip uh, showing the solution that we came up with. So how can this animal with such a minute brain have stereo vision, and how do you even test this? Vivek decided that the best way was to take the insect to a 3D action movie. Really? In order to see the movie, Vivek needs to make some very, very tiny 3D glasses for the praying mantis. We came up with the idea of 3D glasses with these two different glasses on each eye. Each eye could be shown a different stimulus. So after various attempts at getting this done, the one approach that seemed to work was to use colored filters. It's a quick procedure using beeswax to attach the 3D glasses. 
and also a device that holds the mantis in the stand for the experiment. So I think we've got the green filter on the left eye and the blue filter on the right eye. So I'm just going to put it on the stand. How can they make sure the mantis is really seeing 3D? Prey mantises will only strike at prey if they are close enough to their target. Ginny and Vivek make sure that the computer screen is out of the mantis's strike range, but the 3D target is within it. And if the mantis actually sees stereoscopically, it will strike at the 3D target, thinking it is close enough to go in for the kill. Okay, should we go? Yeah. Wait for it. Wait for it. And strike. There you go. So I hope you, you can see the idea that you sometimes see children doing this if they're watching a 3D movie, you know, reaching out to try and grab something that they can see in front of the screen. And we're kind of doing the same thing for the prey mantis. And so we're using these old style anaglyph um, 3D glasses with different colored filters in the two eyes. Now, those are long since superseded for humans. They obviously don't give a brilliant um, quality um, when you're watching a 3D movie because of the color rivalry. Here are the three cone type spectral sensitivities of human vision. But rather conveniently, it does appear that prey mantids are monochromats. So they only have one class of photoreceptor, which is quite unusual for insects. Um, but it's been studied by a few groups and people haven't been able to find more than one class of photoreceptor. And its spectral sensitivity is shown here from another paper by Russell. You can see the sensitivity extends much more into the ultraviolet, but it's still only a single class of photoreceptor. So presumably they don't have color vision and aren't bothered by this color rivalry. And so just to talk you through a bit more how the color works, you might have seen the image on the experimental dis uh, display in that video, you saw a blue disc and a green disc. So the idea is the animals viewing them through these colored filters. And so the image through the blue filter blocks the green light. So you see a black disc you know, where, where there's a green disc, where there's no blue signal coming through. And then in the other eye, it's the blue disc that appears as a hole in the green signal. And so we can present discs or any stimuli with a, an offset, a disparity. And because the mantids don't perceive color, that they'll just you know, see identical but offset images. So yeah, that we can then manipulate that to, dis to simulate depth. So that's what we do. Um, and in the result slides that are coming up, you'll see me in the mantis experiments uh, contrasting the response to crossed disparity and uncrossed disparity. So what I mean by that, for crossed disparity, we figure out where we need to put the stimuli on the computer screen in order geometrically to simulate a virtual object within the animal's catch range. So they've only got little arms, they can only reach out about two and a half centimeters. So we put the object there. And they don't tend to strike at objects that are further away because they know they won't be able to get them. Yes, do, do they judge size? Like yes, in... they do judge size. Well, they judge angular size and they're quite mm -hmm. sensitive to the angular size of prey. So they will only strike at prey that are around 11 degrees across. And this is probably because they're not just prey, uh, predators, they're also prey. So they don't want to attract the attention of a bird or anything that might eat them. So something big is quite threatening to them. And they will just the, tend to stay the, still. But the quality of what they're striking at, circles are just as good as flies. Yeah, there, there's some evidence um, from other studies that they are more likely to strike at things which you put little wiggly insect legs. They certainly like jittery movement. So I, I don't know if you saw in the video, we have that thing spiraling round. Uh, the, the spiraling motion is quite important. Definitely motion is very important, as you'll see. Um, and we found the spiral works quite well. It sort of comes in from the periphery and sort of attracts their attention and you kind of see them, some of those maybe little head movements. And it, th they're watching it and then it sort of comes to rest tantalizingly right in front of them and we have it sort of jitter in place. And then they reach out and try and go for it. So yeah, we, we tend to do discs rather than bothering with the legs and so on just because it's easier. And when we go to the more abstract stimuli, it's not so clear how to put in <laughs> the legs. Um, we're always doing this trade-off between stimuli that are natural enough that the animals will strike, 
because we can't force them to strike and yet um, abstract enough that we can ask the scientific questions we want to ask and, and you'll see that going forward but this is our kind of do the 3D glasses work stimulus so we just use a black disc rather like Russell did um, he used a physical black ball so this is our control, basically, the uncrossed, because you might say, ah, oh, they just like seeing, you know, two discs on the screen. That's what's getting them going. But in the control condition, we swap the left and right images. So once again, there's two discs on the screen, but we've um, disrupted the disparity relationship between them. And of course, we also do controls for which eye is wearing which filter and seeing which color disc. Um, and basically, they never strike in the uncrossed condition, which is confirming that they are indeed using, uh, they are experiencing a stereoscopic percept with our 3D glasses. Okay, so. Uh, can I ask a question there? Yes, uh, so, um, uh, uh, did you also try the, uh, like a white disc against the gray background? Uh, I mean, are they also responding to that stimulus? Yeah. They respond much less. So the existing literature um, on mantis prey preference had indicated that they are much more likely to strike at a dark object on a bright background than vice versa, which we think is because, you know, the, if you think of a fly against the sky, it's darker than the background, and that tends to be true of the prey that they're going for. So we've mainly con concentrated on things that are either camouflaged against the background or darker than the background, depending on the question that we're asking. Mm -hmm. Right, so if we can finally get on to trying to probe how their 3D vision works. And I want to tell you a little bit about what we've learned so far. So the first question I wanted to go after was this question of cross correlation. So the idea that correlation is the fundamental goodness of fit metric in human stereopsis and in owl stereopsis. So what about mantis stereopsis? And I wanted to use a stimulus that Xiaoping will be extremely familiar with, um, the anti-correlated random dot pattern. But for those of you who aren't quite so familiar, um, by a correlated random dot pattern, I basically mean what I've been talking, or a correlated stereogram is what I've been talking about so far. So the two eyes images are identical apart from an offset that corresponds to the disparity. And we're just using a random dot pattern because it's very abstract and doesn't have any other cues to depth apart from the disparity. Now, an anti-correlated one is the same, but now you flip the contrast of one eye's image. So wherever you've got a white dot in the left image, you have a black dot in the right image and vice versa. And that's informative in humans and owls, because if this were a live talk, I would have handed out 3D glasses and got you to put them on. You would be experiencing a disc hanging out in front of the screen, a good depth percept in this correlated stereogram, but anti-correlation just completely destroys your stereo vision and it just looks like a complete mess. And except under certain special circumstances, if you work very hard, you're basically not gonna see any depth in the anti-correlated stereogram. And this is one piece of evidence which suggests to us that correlation is so important for human vision. So I wanted to ask, what about the mantids? Do they perceive depth in anti-correlated random dot patterns? Now, there is a small complication. <laughs> mantids only strike at things that they think are prey, and they only eat live prey, and they only strike at things that move. It's, it's quite interesting, actually, watching videos of prey mantis. You can see them strike at things that, on, on face value, they look as if they're not moving, but actually you can almost always see that there's like an antenna movement or a leg movement, something that's giving the prey away, and that triggers the strike. So we couldn't put up a static image and hope the mantis would strike at it. It would just ignore it. So we had to use a random dot pattern with a moving stimulated bug. And so that's what we did, and this is what I'm showing here. So we have a random dot pattern, just like we do for humans, but I'm now taking a little patch of it, one patch in the left eye, one patch in the right eye, it's indicated by the color coding, and I'm moving it around the image in the same kind of spiral trajectory that we found works quite well for getting them going. And exactly as you saw previously, we can manipulate the disparity. So this is a crossed disparity where the right eye is seeing something on the left of the screen, again, as indicated by that blue color coding, but we could swap it over and have an uncrossed disparity uh, and see if the animal would strike at that. 
so this is sort of what it looks like as it goes around the screen. Um, again, I, you, you haven't got 3D glasses, so you won't be able to see that. Um, but that, that's what the experiment looked like, um, except that we used the colors suitable for the mantis. And one thing I wanted to point out is that the, the target is perfectly camouflaged in any single frame. So if I pause the video like this, you can't see where the target is. There's literally nothing that could give it away other than its disparity. So monocularly in a single frame, it, it's beautifully camouflaged. Of course, the motion breaks the camouflage um, you know, for, for a moving object. So we use that stimulus. Um, and what I'm plotting here is distance from the screen. So it's perhaps a slightly odd way of, of displaying it, but I did that for comparison with the human um, results. So the screen's at 10 centimetres, so our crossed condition where the object is 2.5 centimetres in front of the animal, it's 7.5 centimetres in front of the screen. We also did one where there was zero disparity, so the stimulus is on the screen, and then the undefined distance is the uncrossed, where actually the lines of sight diverge, so there is no difference. And then we're plotting the probability that these mantises, you can see there was around 10 of them, probability that they would strike at the different conditions. And you can see they're far more likely to strike at the crossed condition than the uncrossed. Even in these complex images where the target's perfectly camouflaged in each frame individually. So that was an interesting result straight away. It interested me. <laughs> but the really interesting thing I thought was the anticorrelated results. So in exactly the same way, we can now flip the contrast polarity of the dots in one eye. So just to show the human results, we, we did it with the moving spiral disc just for completeness, but we sort of knew what we were going to find. We asked people, do the, does the disc look in front of or behind the screen? And when the disparity was such that the object was closer the, than the screen, the geometry specified that it was closer, people correctly report that it appears closer. When it's far away, they correctly report that it appears far. When we make the dots anticorrelated, or uncorrelated, which is where we just use unrelated random dot patterns in the two eyes. They're just completely at chance. So different individuals adopt different strategies. Like you can see some people are always answering far, some are always answering near, um, but overall their response is not varying with the sign of disparity. So they can't discriminate the sign of depth in these images. Okay, so we knew that would happen from the extensive literature and humans, but what happens in mantids? Well, whatever we did, the mantids were completely unfazed by the correlation of the dots. So we have correlated on the left, anticorrelated in the middle, uncorrelated in the right. It's the same layout as before. And you can see the mantids are striking when the disparity is crossed, and they're not striking when it's on the screen or uncrossed. The different colours are for large and small dots. Um, we wondered whether we would get different results depending on the size of the dot relative to the omatidium of a mantis eye, given their low resolution, but actually we couldn't detect any difference at all. It really didn't seem to matter. So I just want to emphasise the great difference here between humans and mantises and their response to these images. These are really unnatural images, right? Random dot patterns are unnatural to begin with, and then we've made them anti-correlated, which is a situation that never happens in the real world. And unsurprisingly, that completely destroys human depth perception. And yet it basically has no effect at all on the mantis depth perception. So that was surprising to me because I must admit, I came with this sort of prejudice from the human literature that correlation would matter a lot. But actually, once I thought about it a bit more, it's actually fairly easy to reconcile with, with similar mechanisms, but you need a different front end. So what I mean is, suppose mantis vision is based on temporal change. So basically, you pass the inputs to each eye through a high pass temporal filter. So at the top, I've got a stimulus as it enters the eye. This is actually a second order motion stimulus. I don't know if you can see, but none of the dots are moving, but they're changing their contrast polarity. And this little target moving across the screen is defined by where the dots are changing their polarity. So like these white dots here, you might notice them briefly changing black as the target passes over them. But if you pass that through a high pass temporal filter, you get a little ring as the contrast changes. 
And if the Mantis visual system is doing that at their front end, then that would explain these results. You wouldn't be sensitive to the correlation because you're just asking, is something changing in the two eyes? And then you extract the disparity of the point in the visual system where things are changing. So that could be how Mantis stereopsis ends up looking so fundamentally different to human. The human stereopsis is based on this really detailed pattern of light and dark in the two eyes. But Mantis stereopsis, it seems, is based on where images change over time and is actually insensitive to the details of the pattern of light and dark. So if you want to read more about our logic and you know, the um, different experiments we've done um, to um, back up that claim, then I'll point you to these two papers. But if it's all right, I'd like now to move on to the neurophysiology results that we've done so far. Um, has anyone got any sort of questions at this point about the behavior? Just one question, do they ever adapt? Like, so in the case that you did the PRISM experiment or the, the Russell Fleet's PRISM experiment, will they, in the end, will they learn that they're... There's no evidence that they do. Um, I don't think anyone's really tried testing it long term. So Russell just put them in front of the prisms for, you know, an hour or so. Um, my guess would be that they probably wouldn't. I don't think they have that kind of plasticity built in. I think we have to because, you know, we've got mobile eyes, our eye muscles change over time. We live 80 years. We have to develop these mechanisms. My guess would be that they don't. But I'm afraid we just don't know. I guess some another line of evidence that leads me though that conclusion there's a really nice paper showing that even if they're raised in the dark as soon as you give them light they know how to use stereopsis which suggests that it's hardwired to a far greater extent than humans as you know if you raise kittens or god forbid human babies in the dark they would not have normal stereo depth perception or normal vision when they emerged great yeah, so we also wanted to uh, use one of the great advantages of the insect system, which is that in theory, at least, it should be so much easier to understand than a complicated primate brain and so much more accessible to experiments. So in talking about what we, we've uncovered, I'd like to begin by um, drawing your attention to this comment from the literature. So um, these are two experts, Carl Crowell and Frederick Pretz, um, experts on mantis vision. And you can see from this quote that they're pretty skeptical about the whole idea of mantis stereopsis. So they refer to Russell's results as just a hypothesis that mantids use binocular disparity. Um, I'd challenge that behaviorally, but certainly they're laying out a very common view and a very reasonable view, I think, in the literature that, okay, mantids may have a form of stereopsis, but it's really, really different to human stereopsis, and it's far simpler, and it involves much less neural machinery, um, which I think is a reasonable point of view. So Ronnie Rosner, um, very talented neurophysiologist, who spent a number of years in the lab really going after what is the neural basis of mantis stereopsis, what neural machinery do they have? And I have another video uh, to show you, which uh, shows some of his um, approaches. But how does it work? To find out, Ronnie Rosner has begun to map the nerve cells involved. What's that noise? These are the electrical pulses, neurons used to communicate with each other. Ronnie places electrodes inside individual neurons in the mantis's brain and records electrical signals while showing the mantis the 3D moving circle. And it looks like this neuron might actually be a visual neuron responding to our learning disk stimulus. Ronnie uses this setup to figure out what it is particular neurons are responding to. Once he's found an interesting neuron, it's off to the microscope to have a closer look. So what you're seeing here is an actual nerve cell in the brain, the brain that has been stained. And now, finally, we know how the neuron actually looks like, which we recorded earlier. Ronnie is then able to construct 3D images of each nerve cell he studies. This particular cell is one of the most exciting neurons we recorded from because it responds to prey-like objects in uh, the striking range of the brain mantis. So when we saw the mantis striking a neuron like that, would have been firing. Exactly. And you 
can get a better understanding in this way of where the neuron might receive input here, for example, or here, and where it might send its output here or here. Ronnie hopes to build a map of all the neurons involved in 3D vision in the mantis. There you go. So Ronnie's work is enormously demanding. It involved um, intracellular recording from these neurons. But as you can see, he gets these beautiful anatomical results. So he's not only recorded from the neuron, but filled it and then reconstructed it in great detail. And I know I'm slightly running out of time, but I'd like to describe three different classes of neuron which Ronnie has uncovered. And he's named them based on their anatomy. And the first one he called Tau Pro. And this is a neuron that he found because it was tuned to the disparity of the spiraling disc. So we have the, the control condition, the uncrossed and the near condition. And what you're seeing, the top is just a graph of the stimulus, um, X and Y position. And then this raster plot is the response of the neuron. Um, and then at the bottom, you have that averaged into a firing rate impulses per second as a function of time. And you can see it is responding to the uncrossed uh, situation, but it's responding a lot more to the crossed uh, disc with the disparity uh, indicating that it's within catch range. So that was very suggestive, but there are a number of ways in which a stimulus like this is uncontrolled. It could maybe be subject to various artifacts, like maybe um, there's a monocular neuron and it depends exactly where the monocular receptive field is. So we wanted to do a more controlled stimulus. And so Ronnie introduced this disparate bar stimulus. So instead of a disc, we're seeing a vertical bar on the screen or two vertical bars, one in each eye. And the rationale there was that by using a vertical bar, we didn't have to waste time trying to localize the receptive field, at least along the vertical axis, which is less important for disparity. Uh, disparity is all about the horizontal offset. And Ronnie isn't able to hold these cells for very long. He'd only got them for about 10 minutes max, maybe less. So time was definitely at a premium here. So seen from above, you've got, we had six different possible bar positions, um, each uh, some tending 13 degrees and six different possible locations in both eyes. So a very coarse sampling, but again, because of reasons of speed. And so there are 36 possible combinations of binocular bars, and we also added in the six monocular positions in each eye. And each or many of the different uh, binocular combinations simulate a physical bar in front of the screen. Okay, so a bar at position four in the left eye and three in the right eye could be produced physically by a bar at this location in space. And so what I'm going to show you are these sort of matrices sort of where I've got position in the left eye and the right eye along the axes, and then I'm going to use pseudo color to indicate the neurons mean response to a stimulus at that location. Okay, and then you know different positions in the matrix mean different bar locations. Now, some retinal locations, you know, there is no single physical object that could create those retinal images. So they're the equivalent of the uncrossed condition. And so out of the 36 binocular bar combinations, uh, 21 correspond to locations in 3D space. Um, six are obviously the bar conditions on the screen and 15 are in front of the screen. I've shown those at the top left here, color coded blue. And then a further 15 combinations do not correspond to any point in space, and those are the orange. And we tried to choose the bar locations so that we were covering interesting locations in space, such as 26 millimeters, which is very much the catch range of the animal. So zooming in there, these are the bar locations in space. And it's a little bit busy, but I hope you get the idea. <laughs> And then what I'm plotting here is the response of an actual tau pro neuron. So that matrix that you saw before, and then here are the monocular responses to a monocular bar in the right eye or in the left eye. And these sort of contours that are superimposed on mark the distance of the simulated bar in space for the top left where there is such a thing. And the sort of olive colored uh, things are the um, azimuthal location of the bar in space. Okay, so let me know if you have any questions about how to interpret this. But basically what we're seeing is monocularly, the neuron responds to a bar 
at six degrees um, in the left eye, six degrees to the left of straight ahead. And when you have binocular um, responses, it carries on responding to that um, location. So we see the sort of stripe across the image. And I'll actually move to interpolating to make the structure clearer. So you, you see that the peak is around this location, which I'll mark with this sort of turquoise blob. And then if you um, back project and say, well, what does that mean in space? It corresponds to roughly this. So it's very much within the kind of catch range of the animal. So that's kind of significant. We found a neuron that seems tuned to ecologically relevant stereoscopic distances. So how do you bring that about? Well, you can notice that there's no response at all to monocular bars in the right eye. So if you simply tested this neuron with one eye at a time, you might conclude that it was only receiving input from the left eye. But that's not true, because when we have the binocular bar, you can see that the response to the bar in the left eye is modulated by the position of the bar in the right eye. This stripe isn't uniform, but it's lower here than it is in the middle there. And so that suggests there must be inhibitory input from the right eye at certain positions to reduce this response. So to model that, we went to a model that's very familiar from the vertebrate literature introduced by Azawa et al. in 1990. It's really simple and it just suggests that there's a receptive field in the left eye and in the right eye and you compute the inner product of the image with the receptive field in each eye individually, and then you combine them linearly. We've added in some tonic input because many of these neurons have a spontaneous firing rate, which isn't typical for vertebrate cortical neurons. And then finally, you have some output nonlinearity. And that model actually, interestingly, turns out to be sensitive to the correlation of inputs from left and right eyes. So it's a neural basis for the cross-correlation metric that we were discussing earlier. But it also turns out to be a pretty good model of mantis neurons. So this is the model that we fitted to the cell you've just seen. Um, this is effectively the left eye receptive field, but it's very coarsely sampled. Really what we're getting is the response to a bar at these different locations. And the right eye input, as you see, it's got this inhibitory response indicated with the negative red bars. So it's got this sort of center surround structure. And if you say, well, what good, are, how well does this model account for the cell? There's the cell itself on the left. And this is the model response to that, fitted to that cell. And you can see it, it gives a very good account, although it, it's certainly got a high number of free parameters for the um, amount of data. So that's the physiology of this neuron. What about the anatomy? So we can see that it actually receives input in the um, more peripheral areas of the visual um, area of the mantis brain, the optic lobe. And it sends output, it projects to a region of the mantis brain where descendant motor neurons receive input. So again, that's very suggestive. So in a more sort of schematic diagram approach, uh, using these symbols to represent input, it's receiving input in this visual area and sending output uh, perhaps uh, to a motor neuron. But I want to notice, you might think, ah, oh, strange, it, you know, it's not binocular, <laughs> it's only on one side of the brain. It's unilateral, but it's actually already binocular, as we've seen, right? It's receiving inhibitory input from the right eye. So how is it getting input from the right eye, given that anatomically it's only on the left side of the brain? Well, the next neuron may provide a possible answer to that. Um, Ronnie also found these COCOM, columnar commissure neurons, which are interesting because they span right across the brain, all the way from left to right optic lobes. And they receive input in one lobe, um, the same side as it's got its cell body, and sends output to the other side of the brain, as well as to the central brain. And this neuron too is disparity tuned. So this is response of a COCOM neuron to the spiral disc. So again, you're getting a greater response to cross disparities. And this is its response to our disparate bar stimulus. And once again, we've got a clear peak very much within the catch range and really no response at all to these impossible distance stimuli. So if you have a pair of COCOM neurons, yet each one can take input from one side of the brain and deliver it to the other side of the brain. So pairs of COCOM neurons could combine binocular information. So this is the sort of picture we have here that they're receiving input 
and delivering it right across to the other side of the brain. And then finally, because I know I'm running out of time, um, I wanted to talk about another really interesting neuron Ronnie found that I absolutely had not expected. And what's unusual about this neuron is that its inputs are in the central brain. So with these anatomical reconstructions, you can make very informed guesses about where the likely input and output areas are. And the input areas seem to be in the central brain, and then it's delivering the output very widely all across the medulla, which is an early visual area, sometimes likened to V1, although of course that's an incredibly um, approximate relationship. So to put that on my wiring diagram, here's TME sen inputs in central brain delivered right down to the medulla. So it seems to be the natural way to interpret this is it's part of a feedback loop, right? So we've got feed forward input from Tau Pro, but apparently some feedback provided by TME sen. We don't know why that's there or what it's doing. Obviously, that's a fascinating thing to investigate. One speculation we have is that it could be to do with visual attention. So we know that mantids, if they see something moving and then it stops, they continue to be very alert to what's going on in that region of space so that a subsequent antenna flick can trigger a strike. And maybe TME SEN is sending an attentional signal and uh, making you be more, um, to raise the gain essentially on inputs in that region of space. But that's speculation at this point. However, what is not speculation is that I think we've really shown that the mantis absolutely does have the neural machinery to, to do stereopsis in really quite a sophisticated way. In fact, we found the, these things like the disparity feedback to early cortical areas have not been identified in primates. I think most people would think they're plausible, but you know, just given the complexity of a primate brain, no one's actually identified them. And yet here they are in the insect brain. So to try and summarize what we've learned so far, I would say early on, it seems that mantis stereopsis is fundamentally different to human because it has a different front end. So as I tried to explain earlier, but later on, when you're talking about the brain mechanisms, I've been surprised by just how similar mantis stereopsis is to human. So I was not expecting to find multiple classes of disparity selective neurons, for example. Um, I was not expecting that the, the energy model that we took from Azawa et al would explain these neurons so well, but that's a very similar basic computation um, that applies to both taxa. And actually, as I say, mathematically, it would make them sensitive to the correlation between left and right inputs, but the difference is the front end. So don't think of the inputs as being the pattern of light and dark as they are for humans. In mantids, they're probably more like temporal change. As I, to summarize um, the key points, I won't, I think, bother reading them out, but these are what I've aimed to cover in the talk. Thanks very much for your questions um, and feedback during the talk, uh, and I'll be really happy to have a more wide ranging discussion now. Thanks very much. Um, hi, hello. Um, I have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, so, uh, if, if in the nature, if a mantis accidentally get injured in one eye, so it only have one functional eye left, will it still be able to catch prey? That's a great question. So one thing in the literature that, that again made people think binocular vision and stereopsis must be important for mantids, if you cover one of their eyes, it actually triggers what's called the monocular cleaning reflex. So instead of behaving normally, the animal stops what it's doing and kind of goes like this. And apparently it's a, a way of trying to get off whatever, you know, leaf or bit of gunk has got over its eye. I don't know if, if you don't then remove the covering, I actually don't know if they starve to death or if they hunt, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that they're strongly impaired. So it really seems that their binocular vision is very important for successful hunting. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Yes, if you give them a low contrast um, image, can they integrate over time? Oh, we've looked a little bit at the contrast sensitivity. So one of the first things we did, I was kind of like studying a new species, have to get its contrast sensitivity function. Um, so we did that using their optimotor response. We had gratings across the CRT screen, and they're rather amazing. If you have a pattern, any sort of pattern that's moving left or right, they just move with it. You know, it's, it's a bit like the optokinetic okay. in humans, yeah. it's their whole body. So we asked about what's the highest, you know, temporal and spatial um, frequency 
and, and contrast, you know, that, that we can still trigger that response, right? And when you no longer trigger that response, you assume they can't see it anymore. I, I'd expected that they would have very high um, temporal sensitivity to temporal frequency, but actually they, they really didn't. Um, they couldn't track stuff much beyond about eight or 10 hertz, as far as I recall. So in contrast to flies that have very, very rapid um, you know, sensitivity to temporal frequency. And I suppose that reflects their lifestyle, like right? <laughs> prey mantids are not flying around like flies, they're spending most of their time sat waiting for prey. So did, did that address your question? Well, quite, I, was, I was more interested in the information integration, right? Can they actually accumulate information over time if it's, if it's poor quality? So like these neurons, can they support something more than just an immediate term? I'm afraid, I think I have to pass on that. I don't know any data that speaks to that. It would be very interesting. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Mm, of course. Yeah. Hi. So oh, do you sometimes also give them like a two objects in depth? So such as a depth clutter, a clutter of objects. How do yes. They... Yes, we do. I'm not sure we've actually any, ever published anything on that, which is kind of really annoying me because it's mm. so critical to the correspondence problem. But amongst the unpublished files of data, we, we've been spiraling disk thing. We've done things where there are many spiraling disks. Um, and only one of them has got the correct disparity, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. And we did something where, where disks are sort of appearing and spiraling and appearing mm -hmm. and spiraling, and then eventually one appears with the correct disparity. And they can certainly, they only strike when the one appears with the correct disparity. But what worries me is we place that one directly in front of the animal. So it seemed to me that it's not that good a control because suppose your, your stereo correspondence problem is simply ignoring anything outside this window right we, that would work as an explanation of that data mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so yeah i didn't feel it answered the question well enough the other thing we've done um is basically like the double nail illusion so you, you put up two discs next mm -hmm. to one another we try and manipulate the geometry uh, so it's very much like that slide i showed for the correspondence problem where there are two possible matches mm. um what we found is you could view it as a solution to the correspondence problem. So in other words, they don't strike at a ghost match that mm -hmm. is, this is a little hard to explain without a slide. I know Xiao Ping will get it, but maybe. The, the, the nail illusion type uh, analogy. Exactly. So people who are not familiar with the nail illusion may not realize what I'm talking about, but it's like there are two objects on the screen, but yeah. you could perceive a ghost object in front. Do they strike at that? Yeah. The answer is basically no, they don't. Um, and Russell did some work on that as well. The question is how sophisticated is their stereo algorithm underlying that? And I actually think it could be explained by the center surround inhibition. So the yeah. side tuning, right? So you have a, an excitatory region. And then as we saw in the neurons, you have an inhibitory yeah. region. So when you've got those two disks, you've actually got one object, one object can be in the excitatory region, but the second object is in the inhibitory region. Mm. Maybe that's what's inhibiting the response. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And actually, that would be my, my current sort of best guess is that that's mm -hmm. how they give the illusion of doing global stereo correspondence, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. they're actually doing something much simpler. And that, I guess, ties into another point that I sort of wanted to make, which is that I think human stereo vision does a detailed depth map over a relatively large portion of the image. So very much like the machine stereo that we saw um, where I had those images with like color coded the different depths of each pixel. I don't think Mantis Stereo Vision is doing that at all. I think it's probably doing, giving you like one number, which is what is the probability that there's something in my catch zone? <laughs> and that, that number varies between zero and one. Mm. It's pretty crude and it's pretty low resolution and it's only designed to answer that question. Mm. So some people, I've spoken to people who work in human vision, and they go, ah, oh, well, that's not really stereopsis. <laughs> and, you know, fine, that's a matter of semantics. It's very different from human stereopsis, but I think yeah. it might be a really useful form of stereopsis for certain simple autonomous applications. Mm -hmm. And that's something I'm interested in exploring further, because I think we go wrong in the, or, you yeah. know, robotics maybe goes wrong by building machine stereo vision algorithms that are too much inspired by humans, which is a kind of gold standard, super complex, all singing, all dancing form of stereopsis. And sometimes you really perhaps should be using the, something like the mantis as your inspiration. Great, yeah. Hi. Maybe we can have one more question. 
already uh, four minutes. Let's see. Okay. Please go ahead. I was wondering, so are there um, regions in the binocular overlap zone where you can definitely say they cannot do stereopsis? That's a little hard to test because what tends to happen, certainly if you allow them the freedom to move, if they see something over here that looks interesting, they will turn towards it. And, and now, of course, it is in the overlap zone, probably not coincidentally. There's some work by Russell um, examining the range of stereopsis, and I think he suggests it goes out to around 20 degrees. Um, but yeah, that, that's, I, I, my guess would be that it's limited to a fairly central region. Um, and so that's the importance of these head turns. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, the, um, uh, thanks, Jenny, for your um, wonderful talk uh, and uh, also um, your nice words and the intriguing uh, presentations today. So um, uh, we will have the uh, one by one meeting next. So um, I think uh, the session um, will be closed uh, uh, for other audience from there. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. See you soon. Yeah. See you. Yeah. See you.